Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's South Pole webinar titled Reaching Net Zero from Ambition to Action. I'm Dave Catley, Associate Director at South Pole for Business Development for Asia, and I'm based in Singapore. I will be your host, and I'm excited to welcome you here to learn more from our South Pole experts and from one of our key clients, the Banyan Group. Next slide, please, Matt. Before we start, I have some housekeeping points which I need to make you aware of. You will all be muted during the session, but please post any questions in the Q&A box, and we'll answer some of these in the Q&A session at the end. Finally, the session will be recorded, and a recording will be sent to you all, registered guests after the webinar, which you are welcome to share internally with any of your colleagues. Today, there are three people contributing to this afternoon's session along with myself. Matt Sprague, a principal consultant from our corporate climate targets for our APAC region, and Ms. Cindy Lee, Senior Vice President of the Banyan Group, the independent global hospitality company. They will both introduce themselves in greater detail as we go along. Thanks, Matt. So for today's agenda, I shall set the scene and provide some of the latest status in relation to net zero standards, as well as some definitions and key findings of our latest South Pole net zero report. Firstly, I will recap where we currently stand globally regarding mean temperature increases and how they relate to the government pledges. Matt will then take us into the second part of the session and discuss how corporates can move from ambition to action and the steps you can take to build out your net zero strategy. Then for the third part of the event, we will move to a question and answer session with Cindy from the Banyan Group, where she will share some insights from her own and, and the Banyan Group's net zero journey. Thanks, Matt. So, no one on this call needs convincing as to why it is important to take action. However, we wanted to start by setting the scene as to why we must ramp up our ambitions to action during this critical decade between now and 2030. As you can see from the captions, 2023 was officially the hottest year on record and the headlines weren't hard to miss. The effects of climate change are no longer a distant threat, but something impacting our lives worldwide daily. Thanks, Matt. So where do we stand? Back in 2015 at COP21, we, the world, made an international climate commitment to limit the increase in the global average temperatures to well above two degrees, to, sorry, to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. According to the Climate Action Tracker, we're currently sitting at 1.3 degrees. Even under an optimistic scenario where all announced targets and nationally determined contributions or NDCs are implemented, we are currently set to exceed 1.5 degrees and our 2030 pledges and targets are insufficient to keep within this two degrees warming scenario. Looking at government policies and actions, we are on track to exceed 2.7 degrees warming by 2100 which will have catastrophic impacts. These pledges aren't enough to keep global warming to the all important 1.5 degrees. We also therefore need the private sector to act and to act now. Thanks, Matt. So recently COP28 was held in Dubai late last year and reinforced global momentum towards net zero. On the whole, there were moves in the right direction such as the Agreement on Loss and Damage Fund, and some significant financial commitments were made by the EU and the, EU and the US, amongst others. The conference was also a culmination of the Global Stock Take, a mechanism of the Paris Agreement which reviewed the level of ambition, progress and implementation underway in each country. This is a central outcome of the COP, as it contains every element that was under negotiation and can now be used by countries to develop stronger climate action plans by 2025 and set targets for 2035-2040. As part of the global stock take, an agreement was reached to globally 
transition away from fossil fuels by 2050, as well as a triple renewable energy, as well as a triple renewable energy capacity. We have also seen that more and more jurisdictions are introducing mandatory climate reporting. For example, Australia, Malaysia, New Zealand, the UK, South Africa, and Canada, which have introduced mandatory climate disclosures for the largest companies on things such as scope one to three emissions, the financial risks and opportunities arising from climate change and climate transition plans. The ISSB was also released with the intent to streamline sustainability disclosures by consolidating various frameworks such as the TCFD, SASB, CDSB, etc. We are also continuing to see more and more companies called out by the media, by regulators and by investors for greenwashing. We can't let this stop companies from taking action, however, or not sharing progress. We'll talk about the concept of green hushing later, but it's important. It's an important reminder of why we need to walk the walk before you talk the talk. I will now hand over to my colleague, Matt, who will take you through the latest on net zero. Thanks, Dave. Um, hi, everybody. Really nice to meet you today. As Dave said, I'm a principal consultant working in our advisory team at South Pole, focusing on decarbonization and emission reduction strategies for clients across Asia Pacific, all the way from the Middle East through to Japan and, and New Zealand as well. So uh, a pretty broad region, but very excited to be talking to some of our Asian colleagues and uh, Asian clients today around um, increasing ambition from uh, yeah from ambition to action. So we'll start off with some of the latest on net zero, and I'm sure many of you um, will have seen this chart or something very similar to this. But when we're establishing a net zero strategy, there are four key steps that we need to uh, to set in place. First off, we need to start with a robust scope one, two, and scope three baseline and, and we need that to be in place to 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 help us set those targets in a credible way but once we've got that baseline we need to set a near-term target in line with science by 2030 or 2034 at the latest and that should establish that reduction pathway over the next decade secondly we need to set our long-term target also known as the net zero target by 2050 at the latest and that needs to be aligned with a 1.5 degree scenario Thirdly, and we're seeing um, new updates coming out of the Science-Based Target Initiative uh, today around beyond value chain mitigation. It's not a focus of the webinar today, but it's a very important point in um, establishing a credible net zero pathway in terms of compensating and neutralizing um, emissions on the way to net zero. And fourth, but by no means least, in your long-term target year, uh, you need to neutralize residual emissions through the purchase of uh, carbon removal credits that must be balanced and have permanent storage of that carbon from the atmosphere. Whereas they need to be permanent removals, the beyond value mitigation can be using any type of carbon credit such as high quality red plus um, or other uh, options there. So in South Pole's latest net zero report, Destination Zero, which I would invite you all to go onto our website, download. It has got um, hundreds of interesting insights and data points and recommendations and findings. But really today we're just giving a very high uh, snip, snip, sneak peek of some of the key findings from, from our perspective. But we surveyed over 1400 climate conscious companies and by Climate Conscious, it's a company that has uh, a dedicated head of sustainability or a similar role at a director level and typically has over a thousand employees other than companies in Singapore, um, which we allowed to be slightly smaller based on the, uh, the response that we had there. But of those companies surveyed, we found that 83% of them have set a net zero target, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I mean, there's still 17% left of this group and these are the companies that are um, talking about being ambitious so in the wider population of companies that we analyze it's, it drops down to eight percent 
So there's an awful lot of work there for those 92% of companies that have not set net, net zero targets. And even within those 8%, um, we would estimate that some of those are not aligned with science. Um, and by that, I mean a 1.5 degree scenario, including scope three um, and decarbonizing um, rapidly today without the use of carbon credits. Another interesting insight that we identified was that 44% um, of companies say that it's got harder in the past year, um, which is interesting. It may be going down to the, the changing landscape, the changing um, compliance regulations and reporting requirements as well. So 81% of companies say they're on track um, to achieve their targets, which is fantastic, but around a quarter say that it's harder than expected. So I don't know, 75% already knew how hard it was maybe, um, or have not really got started and are about to find out how hard it is. But what we're here to do today is to break it down into um, into little steps um, with making it a little bit easier to digest um, and hopefully get you moving into action. Okay. Green hushing, we've seen a lot more of, uh, and it is becoming the, green, the new normal, unfortunately. So it means that companies are setting targets and that are not talking about it. So we need our leaders to lead and we need um, the, to talk about our, their challenges, their wins and where they're failing. Um, and what we need is, is more, more talking about this as well to make it the more, uh, business as usual that companies are decarbonizing. The other thing that this, these findings really show is the tension, um, that's the increasing need for disclosure, increasing stringency, and the increasing fear of getting it wrong. So there's a very good balance into making sure that climate claims and roadmaps are credible, they're transparent, they're complete, is getting more and more important for internal and external stakeholders and um, auditors and regulators uh, as well. So when we're talking about frameworks, um, there are a few uh, and that number is growing. The, the leading one is still the science-based target initiative. So the SBTI's net zero standard is um, the gold standard in terms of setting these credible climate targets, but it's not um, a one-stop shop. It doesn't work for every business and it doesn't work for every business sector, depending on um, some a number of metrics such as growth or um, carbon intensive sectors, for example. And there are some pathways that are specific to different sectors, um, but companies may need to look at alternatives to the SBTI if um, there's for some reason can't comply with that. Other than the SBTI, we have uh, a new ISO standard around carbon neutrality, and they're developing their net zero guidelines um, coming soon. We've got the Race to Zero, which is a UN-backed global campaign more to drive public and private sector decarbonization. Uh, we've got the UN net zero frameworks as well, which is similar to the Race to Zero. Um, and then out of the UK, we've got the uh, Transition Pathway Initiative, which helps companies set pathways uh, in line with IEA and as well we have IEA so they are more focused on the energy sector um, in terms of pathways to decarbonize as well and they assist with scenario planning but the main message is here is that you know there is not one size fits all um, and that there are different options for different companies So, as I said, the SBTI is still the leading standard. There's a few reasons for that. One is um, awareness of it. It's very well recognized. It has broad applicability and it gives you a formal certification. So it's the only standard out there that gives you certification that your target can be validated, uh, that it is in line with best practice and in line with climate science. And it 
finally aligns with best practice scenarios such as the IEA, and they work closely in developing their target frameworks and their sexual decarbonization pathways. But as I said, it's not for everyone. So you need to identify the suitability for your sector and the requirements can be quite challenging to meet for certain sectors as well. But when, uh, when we put this together, and I'm sure the number has changed significantly since then, but around 7,400 companies are registered with uh, the SBTI in terms of making commitments with around nearly 3,000 companies having uh, a net zero commitment and four and a half thousand setting SBTs and having those validated as well. So the SBTI is currently um, developing new frameworks, new pathways, new options for different companies, and they are considering um, new, new guidelines for, for different sectors. So we've seen the maritime transportation, the steel sector, and the financial institution guidelines released recently. Um, there's a draft versions for automakers and the building sector, and the oil and gas framework is in development as well. There's currently no pathway for oil and gas companies to have a validated target, but that is in the works as well. As well as the sector specific pathways, we're seeing evolving guidelines on um, other, other things such as beyond value chain mitigation. As I mentioned, there was new guidelines um, released overnight. They've recently released their supplier engagement guidance as well. Um, and they're in study at the moment for um, feedback on the use of environmental attribute certificates or renewable energy certificates in climate targets. And they're um, supposed to be um, developing a measurement reporting and verification standard as well, which would really help um, watch uh, track progress towards targets. So where does the new ISO standard uh, come in? Yeah, sorry about the background noise, if anyone can hear it. Um, it's bath time for kids here in Sydney. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you might have to listen to a little bit of screaming, I'm afraid. So where does the new ISO standard come in? Um, it is the climate change management standard uh, focusing on carbon neutrality. So it requires companies to calculate their footprint purchase carbon credits, but it also requires you to set targets that are aligned with science, but it is not a net zero standard. It is a tangible stepping stone in that direction. Um, and many companies are now looking at this standard to assess whether it's useful for them to start their journey. Um, and, it try, and it helps companies avoid unsubstantiated or misleading claims of carbon neutrality, um, which do need to be avoided as this opens company up to greenwashing accusations especially across uh, Europe and France, there is now legal precedent to avoid greenwashing claims. Um, and we can see that um, legislation potentially rolling out in other jurisdictions. So to sum up this section on various frameworks, um, our, our key tips to choosing uh, the framework that works best for you is, is to check your eligibility. So if there is a, a credible SBTI pathway, for example, that might be suitable for your sector, then maybe that's the best way to go. Um, there is always the cross-sector pathway, which works for everybody, but to check the standards uh, and your suitability for them. Try and align your requirements. So being able to explain your framework is really important to stakeholders, especially if it's not SBTI. So if you pick a different pathway option, make sure that you understand why and that you can communicate that clearly and aim high. So this is a, a webinar on am ambition and action. So making sure that those targets are ambitious and they do align with a 1.5 degree outcome. So setting targets which are less ambitious than 1.5 degrees is no longer seen as, as credible um, and companies should look to, to set the highest level of ambition they can. And then, uh... So, so that was about ambition and setting targets. So now we're moving into the action part of this uh, session. Do you just want to take a minute, Matt? Oh, do you, do you just want to take a minute, Matt? I think this would be a good opportunity for people just to think about questions at the end of that section and maybe just put them in the chat box. Just take a couple of minutes and then uh, we move on to the next bit. No problem. Yeah, uh, feel free. I can give people a minute maybe to add to, to the Q&A box and we can get to those if we uh, if we want to get to those in a second
Great, so the recap is the latest developments on SBTI, if anybody has any questions around them, uh, the different various frameworks with regards to ISO, United Nations, the IEA, uh, any specific or pertinent questions with regards to that, and how we look to address the balance of the 17% as Matt referenced and also attract new people with a new interest to sign up for SBTI. Thanks, Dave. Okay, cool. Okay. Back to you, Matt. We'll, we'll move on. Uh, wonderful. So once we've set those targets, um, you do need a plan to get there. So there's five key steps to identifying the, the roadmap and developing your approach to decarbonization. So as I mentioned, starting off with that really robust emissions baseline is, is critical. So making sure that you've got good granularity, good accuracy in the numbers, you're confident in where those numbers have come from and how they've been calculated. Um, and there aren't too many extrapolations and gaps. There are always going to be some, but we want to make sure that those are limited um, and, and really restricted to immaterial emission sources if possible. So we've gone through the target setting approach now. So making sure that those are credible and ambitious is really, really important. So when we get into the decarbonization piece, we want to go through an identification and prioritization of emission reduction projects. So starting with a really long list and here it, it becomes very important to go and talk to your teams, go down to the ground, work out who's who has challenges around decarbonization. Some of the ideas there might be the one that makes the, a real big switch. So starting off with a long list of, of ideas and decarbonization levers. And then we can start going through screening and prioritization and identifying which ones will have the material impacts on your footprint. And then we can model those. We can model the progress, identify any gaps to target over uh, that 10 year near term timeline and the 2050 long term timeline and try and identify some opportunities to close those gaps. And this is not meant to be a static strategy. It is a living document. It needs to be reviewed. It needs to be refined. Whenever you implement a project, it might go fantastically well, or you might get roadblocks. So identifying what those roadblocks are, and conversely, why the good project went well, um, you can then apply it to future decarbonization projects as well. They're not all going to go incredibly smoothly. Um, so making sure that it is reviewed, that if, you're, if a project doesn't quite hit the decarbonization, uh, volume that you were expecting, identifying why not, and then identifying more projects to help close that gap is going to be really important. So how do we model emission reductions? There's six categories that we typically look at. Um, the first and most importantly is the impact. So how much will it actually reduce emissions for from implementing that project? The uptake is how much of the project you'll you'll go ahead and do. Um, an example here is replacing vehicles with electric vehicles. So you might want to switch out 50% of your vehicles. So your uptake would be 50% there. Timeline, so when will it be pro when will the project be implemented? We might have that EV target by 2030, for example. Feasibility, is there technical maturity? Depends on your market. You know, the renewable energy opportunities in Singapore are very different to renewable energy opportunities in Europe, Australia, and North America, for example. Cost is, is always a, an interesting and important step and uh, business decisions have to be made. And this is where business and sustainability can um, coexist or challenge each other. So identifying cost, cost effective opportunities and, and investment models to, to decarbonize is important as well. And then risks. Are there any significant risks that would implement um, impact the implementation that we need to identify early that we can overcome? So to, to give you some examples of where you could start, just looking at scope one and two, we've suggested you should go and look at offsite renewable energy. So this is your green tariffs, your EACs, your corporate power purchase agreements, um, working with a retail partner in your in your country to identify what green energy or renewable energy opportunities they can they can offer through your standard uh, electricity contract. On-site renewable energy, so this would be the installation of wind or solar either on your site or, or near to your site and having a, a direct line into your into your uh, electrical system. 
energy efficiency should should never be forgotten um, it's really really important if we can reduce demand it's the it's the best energy that we can that we can use is no energy um, so that could be through improving your processes um, installing new equipment retrofits and smart metering as well and then fuel switching so the EV uh, project I suggested on the previous slide um, switching from diesel to biodiesel or straight to electric and then um, depending on the clients we have uh, a lot of building sectors have high refrigerant loads so replacing those refrigerants with uh, low global warming potential refrigerants or replacing the chiller system and the uh, hvac system with low, low gwp and high efficiency uh, options is is quite a good decarbonization lever as well and then if you're in a processing or um, manufacturing sector identifying what fugitive emissions might be, what gases you're using, and look, identifying if there are any alternatives. Scope three is, is slightly different. Um, so here it's not always within your direct control. You can't just go and replace the chiller, for example. You can't go and replace your LED lights, for example. Here you need to work with partners, suppliers, and clients. And the questions that we need to start asking to have the biggest impact is how are my people moving and how are they working so this is looking at employee commuting working from home working from office travel policies business travel are they, are they you know are they flying to meetings when they could have got the train for example so what policies can you put in place to support um low low carbon business travel how are my goods being moved around so when you purchase anything um how is it being transported is it being flown in um this this also applies to products that you're selling so the products that you're selling are you flying them to your the country of, of sale or are they being shipped are they on electric vehicles for example there so identifying logistics partners that can help you decarbonize is really important as well what are we buying and from who similarly identifying low carbon suppliers is is going to be important and working with your supply chain to set their own science-based targets is a really a uh, really powerful lever to help decarbonize a, decarbonize your own portfolio and then what happens to the things we sell or the things we use um, circularity is becoming uh, more more and more common in the sustainability um, space so looking at reuse opportunities extending product lifetimes can you redesign your your product to um, use less energy have less waste be more recyclable be more circular and then also considering that end of life treatment as an option as well so what happens when it goes to landfill um, what can it be recycled so these are all important questions they're, they're important questions we should be asking our r d team um, around the product design as well as some of the other um, important business considerations that need to be made so addressing your scope three requires engaging your value chain so there are six key levers that we've identified here that can really help you work with your suppliers and your clients and it's around policies uh, the first step is is reviewing you set a low carbon procurement policy that helps your procurement team identify low carbon suppliers that's going to be a really good lever identifying key stakeholders in your value chain looking at supply chains you may have one or two or three key suppliers that sell you 90 percent of your of your equipment that's where you should be spending your time and effort working with them not working with the long tail of say 5,000 other suppliers which only give you your, your the other 10 percent and then you should de define your engagement strategy so how do you talk about sustainability how do you talk to your suppliers about sustainability how do you talk to your clients so this is a very important step in terms of communicating and reducing that green hushing that I mentioned earlier. Building internal capacity across the business. This goes from the C-suite all the way through to the procurement teams, say the fleet manager, the operations team as well. Again, how do they talk about sustainability? What is their understanding of it? What is it? How is it important to them doing their work? Implementing the strategy and monitoring progress. So when you work with suppliers, how do you track that they're on track? How do you confirm that their emissions that they're telling you are correct um, and working with them to improve their data collection processes as well? 
so finally, um, we can then take the findings from the roadmap and develop a climate transition plan. This is a longer term strategy and identifies a full decarbonisation roadmap, also taking into account climate risks. It also takes into account procurement and um, positioning as well. So to, to develop a, a robust climate transition plan does take some time and it does take some, some work, but it's a really powerful document that helps you um, work out how you're going to get to net zero and how you're going to be a viable business in a low carbon economy. So identifying that net zero target is the first pillar. Identifying how you'll respond to climate risks and, and climate, op climate opportunities is important as well. Are there new products offerings, new service offerings that you could leverage to, to be uh, a company that operates in, the, in 2050, for example? And then how do you position yourself to support an economy-wide transition? So what other levers do you have outside of your direct control that you can support? Is it new products? Is it new technology? Is it new service offerings? Um, and again, working out how your business will operate in the future is, is where your climate transition plan will, will aid you. So uh, I'll sum up here. So we've we've spoken a lot about the ambition that we need to get to. Dave obviously um, identified some of the the need um, and where we're up to at 1.3 degrees already. Sorry, uh, and then why would why we need this rapid deep decarbonisation? So after today, where do you need to do? Where do you need to go? What do you need to do? So. Um, our four recommendations is to set a target if you haven't already set one, making sure that it's aligned with science, it's ambitious, and it's a, it's 1.5 degrees aligned as well. Go and develop your roadmap, so identifying emission reduction projects, modeling it out, identifying gaps and opportunities to um, reduce your emissions. Start talking to your suppliers. Start educating and engaging your value chain no company in the world will be able to get to net zero on their own without support from their suppliers and partners. So making sure that you're bringing them on your journey is very important as well. And then finally, and not last and not least, it's communicate. So this is very important for to reduce the, the amount of green hushing that we're seeing. Communication, accurate communication, transparent communication, sharing the challenges that you have with um, with your with your viewers and your readers and your guests and your clients and making sure that anybody can pick up your sustainability report, understand where you're up to, understand where your challenges are and how you're going to resolve and, and move forward on, the, on that pathway. So that was the, the end of, of my section and we're going to move into the, the final part of today's um, webinar. Um, again, just a polite reminder, please feel free to add your questions or comments into the Q&A session. I think we've got um, 10 or 15 minutes with um, Cindy Lee from the Banyan Group now, so hopefully we can get um, to some of your questions um, after this section. But um, Cindy, welcome. Hi, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for joining us. Um, maybe before we start, I could get you to give everyone a, a brief introduction into, into your role and who you are at the Banyan Group. Hi, Matt. Uh, thanks for the invite and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Cindy Lee, Head of Projects Development in the Banyan Group, and I um, usually oversee all of our hotel development. Um, in addition, I'm given this task to lead the team eternally on the material topic of climate change. So for the past year, we have been working with South Pole on our decarbonization roadmap and I'm happy to share today our experience so far, Matt. Wonderful. Great to have you along today, Cindy, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So first, first question is, could you share a, a brief overview of the Banyan Tree Group's climate journey so far and what you're working on at the moment? And it would be great to understand your approach to target setting um, based on the SBTI frameworks. Yeah, um, maybe perhaps at this juncture, I'll just give a brief background of the Bayan Group um, for those who don't know us. Um, we are a global group consisting of 12 brands and 76 hotels and resorts and still counting. 
and we have 14 branded residents all over uh, more than 20 countries. And this year we are celebrating our 30th anniversary, <laughs> just for info. Um, when we started out, you know, 30 years ago, we, our leadership have actually committed ourselves to uh, sustainability being a key pillar on how we conduct our business. And with this, we have built on this uh, as our ethos for the past 30 years. Um, even before we embark on this decarbonization roadmap, at the beginning of our operation, we have been, you know, tracking and benchmarking our energy and water consumptions. And because of this need for SGX, we have now focused on um, completing the picture of our GHG uh, footprint. That's how we started with uh, SAPO about a year ago, right? So um, the first thing that we did with SAPO was, of course, to establish our GHG baseline. And this is an enormous task, uh, considering uh, how widespread we are geographically uh, and, and the number of properties that we have, right? So it, as I say, it was an enormous task and, and we did it, I think, in about three or four months uh, last year. Um, so with, with the baseline, we then established uh, or identify our key emission contributors. And together with SAFO, we, we established the near-term targets, which is aligned with the SBTI framework. And hopefully with these um, targets, we could you know, avoid the worst outcome of uh, <clears throat> temperature increasing above 1.5 C. So after establishing our targets, uh, we also did a test case of uh, four of hotels and identified uh, numerous, almost 40 uh, reduction projects. And of course, the cost of implementing this project. So now we're still uh, working on prioritizing uh, which technology to go ahead. <clears throat> uh, I mean, cost is always, a, funding is always an issue. So we're working on prioritization these projects at the moment. And overall, as a group uh, for, as a group, we have to establish the overarching strategy as well together on um, SAFO um, and hopefully achieve our targets uh, set up for the near term in 2030. Great, thanks, Cindy. You mentioned <laughs> that the um, <clears throat> the GHG footprint was a big task and we, we know that understanding your scope three emissions is vital to achieving net zero and, and those near term targets as well. But we see a lot of companies that are concerned about the reliability and difficulty in collecting data from your suppliers. What was your experience in getting internal engagement to address your scope three emissions? Yeah, you're right, Matt. Scope three, it is a challenge. For scope one and two, as I mentioned, we have been tracking our consumption, so it's not an issue. The data are pretty accurate. And the scope three, the biggest challenge is not um, really with uh, uh, getting the data internally. I think uh, all my colleagues across the group has been very, very helpful and in collecting and uploading the data. Uh, I guess what we have been recording for operational and, and financial um, purposes is slightly different from what is required for, for um, calculating our GHG. So uh, we went through a lot of you know, discussion and guidance from our platforms uh, um, vendor um, who, who identify the gaps and make certain you know, assumptions. Um, but I I'm happy to report that for the second round of um, collection this year, we, we did a very good job. We have managed to um, streamline what is required for, for the emission calculation, and it's a less painful process once the system has been set properly. That's good to hear. Um, and hopefully it gets easier year on year as well. So um, yes, looking at your broader value chain, how does your sustainability strategy inform some of the relationships that you have with your key suppliers and, and also your clients and guests? Hmm. Actually, our value change actually starts from our senior management. Um, the tone and, and board vision is set in, uh, in the leadership of the group. And this is really embedded into all the work that we do uh, throughout across the group. And it's a function, not just the leadership, but in, involves all our associates as well. Um, <clears throat> internally, education is the key. Uh, we have our Biantry uh, Bion Academy, which is uh, the, our associates are constantly exposed to learning on best practices in their area of work. 
So it, over the 30 years, we have been constantly drumming the message of reuse, recycle, and you know, repurpose. As for our guests, um, the experience in our stay is very uh, important. It's our top priority. Uh, we believe in travel with a purpose, and our Stay for Good program invites guests to experience the, the world authentically by highlighting the uniqueness of each destination and at the same time honouring the local heritage and tradition and, and respecting the local environment, of course. Um, as for you know, suppliers, our, our suppliers have to you know, go through our code of conduct kind of uh, survey and uh, we always engage with them and make sure their supplies are from sustainable sources and uh, we try to buy as local as possible. Um, all these programs are aligned with our brand for good framework. Fantastic. Um, and I know it, right at the end of the session today, I started talking about climate transition plans and how risks and climate opportunities are becoming more important to be able to pivot and, and stay as a viable business in the future. And, and through the work that you've done with South Pole, we actually went through a, a climate risk and opportunity assessment for the Banyan Group. Um, what insights did you gain into your operations or what insights did you gain um, and how that will change how you do business in the future? Yeah, we have looked at uh, both physical and transition risk. Physical risk like extreme weather, you know, monsoon, increase in, in temperature, and transition risk is like you know changing market and, and uh, changing market trends and, and governmental uh, policies. All these will impact our business. Um, for example, we have identified that you know for for um, locations where there's a, a significant risk of uh, increasing in temperature, uh, our cost for air cooling will be high, right? So that our response to that will be really to look for more efficient cooling and, and you know increasing our shade to reduce uh, our cooling requirements uh, and as for transition risk um, there are potential that at country level you know decarbonization policies like carbon taxes uh, could also impact our costs right the greatest risk will be from suppliers who will pass on the costs uh, through their carbon tax to us so that's why there's a need to really work with partners who who, who can you know, give us low carbon uh, options. So these are the major risks that we have identified. Uh, yes. Great, thanks, Cindy. I, I trust you can hear me. I think I'm having a couple of connection issues at my end, it's, but hopefully we'll get through the next 15 minutes. Yeah, hopefully we'll get through the next 15 minutes without the, uh, without it dropping okay. off. But I've got one last one last <laughs> question uh, for you, Cindy, before. Uh, hmm. Dave can take over and, and go through some Q&A, so hopefully I can get through the next 10 seconds. Um, Oops. For others to take action, and it would be great if you could share any suggestions that you have to those listening today on what they can do to jumpstart or, or continue their climate journeys. I think I lost you a bit, Matt. Oh, sorry. I said, um, what... <laughs> What insights or encouragement do you have for the people listening today on how they can either start or continue their climate journey? Well, I guess you can't jumpstart. There's a lot of preparation, a lot of grounds to prepare. Like I say, for example, data collection, right? You have to make sure or work with your, your experts um, what kind of data is really required because you, you have to start from there. If you don't get the right data, then it's very hard to track your emissions. Um, and of course, you need a, a good infrastructure support internally. I mean, we are lucky for us. Uh, sustainability is is part of our DNA. Uh, the tone sets from the top, like I said, and, and it's not a one-man show. So you need the whole village behind you, so to say. And uh, <clears throat> because there's a lot of work from collection of um, um, data to uploading the data from the various properties, and when we have identified projects to, to be implemented, we also need you know, our rank and file to execute the projects, to track um, the results of the project. So it's, it's a long journey and uh, <clears throat> we need, you know, the support of everyone in the group and everybody has to have that commitment. Yeah. And I'm glad to say we have the commitment within the group. So your, your recommendation is to, to start at the top, make sure that 
the the, the senior leadership are on board and have buy and then you have buy in and then you can really um, spend the time to get the foundations right before um, progressing and, and taking some taking some action. Yes, yes. Fantastic. That, preparing the ground is is important. Fantastic. Well, that that's so insightful, Cindy, and and we really appreciate you joining our webinar today, and and want to thank you so much for um, working with South Pole over the last year, and and we look forward to our ongoing relationship with the Banyan Group over the next few years, and and watching your climate journey uh, grow and and take off. So, thank you yeah. again. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you for having me. The job is not done yet. <laughs> Not at all. It's only the it's only the beginning. <laughs> Very much so. Well, over back. We're going to yeah. hand back to you, Dave, for some for some Q and A. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cindy. Thanks, Matt, particularly for I think highlighting the importance of setting the foundations, the need to engage the value chain and the challenges and importance of doing that, and also the insights in relation to physical and transition risks. So, thank you very much. So. We now have a few more questions and some great questions coming in. Please keep the questions coming in if you have them. We will try and cover as many as we can, but if we run out of time, we will get back to you via email answering the questions post the webinar. So, to the first question, here it is. In the context of Asia's distinct geographical, economic and cultural traits, how do these factors influence the region's strategy in pursuing net zero? I think, Matt, you're best place to answer this one. So over to you, Matt. Yep, I can I can try to start that one off. Um, it is it's very important to make sure that your strategy is embedded in the culture that you operate in. So everybody has very different business drivers. They have different leadership styles. They have different supply chains and identifying what works for your business is an important step. So as Cindy said, laying the foundation. So the frameworks are global, they apply to everyone, but how you achieve it might be different. So there's different nuances, say the renewable energy market is very different across Asia. So China has a very different energy market to Singapore, which is different to India. So again, on understanding some of the infrastructure constraints of your location is gonna be important and making sure that your embedded and you're uh, confident in your strategy before you start talking about um, wildly ambitious claims is, is important as well to make sure that we um, avoid greenwashing. But when you're talking about climate, climate change, climate risk, making sure that it talks to your audience is, is important as well and using different languages that work for your guests or for your clients across different countries it, it is different so it's very different talking to an american versus talking to an australian talking to a to a singaporean talking to from someone from china so making sure that you use the right terminology is important and working with um, local people in terms of how to communicate that's going to be um, helpful to help bring people on the journey in different ways that work for them great thanks matt really comprehensive answer uh, we've had a question come in from uh, Stefano. Uh, his question is, what is the main difference between companies that have committed to SBTI and those that have had their targets validated? Why do companies share when they've com why do com why do companies share they've committed when the real goal is to have them validated? Great question. Great question. Thanks, Stefano. Um... Yeah, it's it's an interesting step. So when you go through SBTI validation, the first option you have is to write a commitment letter to the SBTI. And that commitment letter then starts a clock of two years before you can then apply to be validated. So you can apply at any time in those two years, but from when you've committed, you have two years to apply for validation. So we're actually seeing companies now missing their validation time frame of two years. And it, and, and getting sort of removed from the SBTI's list, which is something that companies should absolutely avoid. So that's, you, you commit and then two years, within two years, you have to submit for validation. And then during the validation window, the SBTI goes through your baseline, they go through your targets, they go through your roadmap a little bit and just check that it's aligned with science. And then you know that your target is, is best practice. Why do companies share that they've committed? It's something to talk about. It is a big decision to commit to SBTI, so it's something to celebrate even committing. 
getting validated is another level. So that's, a, that's an incredible achievement. You get the stamp of approval from the SBTI that your target is in line with science. But yeah, this goes back to talking about your steps that, um, you know, we need companies to talk about it. We need companies to talk that they've committed, that they're getting validated, that they're online, they're on track with their targets. So yeah, I think it's, I think it should be encouraged that you talk about committing because it is a big decision and getting validated is a huge achievement. So something to be celebrated. Back to you, Dave. Thanks, Matt. Uh, okay, unfortunately, we're actually overrun by five minutes. So in the interest of time, I have to stress to everyone that's on the call that have submitted their questions, we will get back to you and we will answer them. Uh, I would also encourage you to, as Matt said earlier, to go onto the website, download the Destination Zero report. So that's it really from the webinar today, Reaching Net Zero from Ambition to Action from us at South Pole and Cindy at the Banyan Group. We hope you found it insightful. From Cindy, Matt and myself, thank you for your time and please don't hesitate to make contact with us if you have any further questions or points we can help you with. Thanks again. Bye bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.